This is gallium, and it's one of the most fascinating elements on the periodic table. It's a metal that melts in your hand, eats through aluminum, and behaves like something out of a sci-fi movie. However, gallium isn't only about melting in your hand and degrading aluminum. It's got some incredible chemical tricks up its sleeve, and so today I want to dive into the science behind gallium and explore some of its weird and wonderful properties. Now first off, what even is gallium? Well, it's a metal with the atomic number 31, nestled in group 13 of the periodic table. Its chemical properties are broadly similar to the other group 13 metals, including aluminum, indium, and thallium, in that it's an amphoteric metal that normally assumes a plus 3 oxidation state. It doesn't exist in nature, and was discovered in 1875 by a French chemist named, and I apologize, Paul-Emile Lecoq du Bas-Bouldron. Fun fact, he actually named it after Gallia, which is the Latin word for France. Or maybe himself, since le coq means the rooster, which is similar to Gallus in Latin. Anyway, one of gallium's most famous tricks is its super low melting point, just 29.76 degrees Celsius. That's about 86 degrees Fahrenheit, meaning it's only slightly above room temperature. Considering this is solidly below human body temperature, I can do this with it. Now, to be fair, I expected this to look a little more dramatic, but it's January and my hands probably aren't terribly warm. Regardless, the point I'm trying to make here is that I can literally melt the stuff in my hand. But why? Gallium has a very weak metallic bonding structure compared to other metals, and so it doesn't take a whole lot of heat energy to go from a solid to a liquid. It's also non-toxic, so this is completely safe, although you'll probably want to wash your hands afterwards. Now here's where gallium gets dangerous, or at least destructive. Gallium can undergo a unique physical reaction with certain metals, namely with aluminum. When you apply it to aluminum, like the surface of a soda can, it diffuses into the aluminum structure, weakening its crystalline bonds. Getting the gallium to actually adhere to the aluminum can be annoying at times, but slightly sanding the surface and a bit of heat usually does the trick. Once the gallium is fixed to the surface of the aluminum, the reaction has already invisibly begun. And after a few hours, this is the result. It's a slow, but ultimately pretty satisfying decay. And it happens because gallium creates an alloy with aluminum, which disrupts its structure, turning a strong, durable metal into something brittle and fragile. I decided later to try this a second time with a much thicker plate of aluminum, and then I allowed the two to sit around and react for a week. During that time, the gallium was completely absorbed into the aluminum, and as you can see, even this thick plate of solid metal became fragile enough to break with my bare hands. Anyway, now I want to move on to one of my favorite gallium experiments, the gallium beating heart. This reaction is a safer, but somewhat more finicky alternative to the classic mercury beating heart. It requires gallium, dilute sulfuric acid, and a small iron nail or screw. I also recommend using warm sulfuric acid to actually get the gallium to liquefy and keep it that way. Once the gallium has melted, I simply touch it with a steel nail to start the reaction. As you can see, the gallium droplet starts to pulse when the nail gets close. In the case of the mercury beating heart, this reaction relies on the oxidation of mercury by dichromate followed by its reduction with iron. Since the mercury oxide has far less surface tension than pure metallic mercury, the oscillation between the two states results in a steady beating. However, gallium has higher activity than either mercury or iron, and this means that air alone is more than enough to oxidize the gallium, but it also means that iron alone isn't reducing the gallium the way it does mercury. Also unlike mercury, gallium doesn't really have significant surface tension. And that being said, despite the two being superficially identical, this reaction is really entirely different than the mercury beating heart. What happens here instead is that when gallium slowly dissolves in the acid, the cationic dissolved gallium ions are attracted to the negative surface of the metal, forming something of an electrochemical double layer. This layer dramatically increases surface tension, which is why the gallium formed a nice ball when it melted. However, when the nail comes close enough to the gallium, the negative charge will flow to the iron and accelerate the production of hydrogen gas there. 
This sudden loss of negative charge disrupts the electrochemical double layer reducing the surface tension and causing the ball to flatten out. The layer and therefore the surface tension regenerate once the iron is no longer in contact and so the gallium ball rounds back out. This is why I said that this version of the beating heart is more finicky than the mercury version. With the mercury beating heart, the oxidation of the mercury causes it to relax toward the iron nail, at which point it's reduced and pulls away. Since contact with the nail and the gallium beating heart causes relaxation rather than contraction, the positioning of the nail is a lot less forgiving. Regardless, when it does finally work, the gallium will oscillate like a little beating heart, making it look alive. It's mesmerizing, and it's a great demonstration of how inorganic chemistry can create seemingly lifelike movements. However, gallium can do a whole lot more than just beat. It can also react with potassium dichromate in what is probably the most completely alien chemical reaction I've ever seen. Watch this. I got a lot more footage of this, which I'll let play out at the end of the video. In the meantime though, gallium's got one more trick up its sleeve that I'd like to show you. Let me introduce you to Gallinstan, an alloy made from gallium, indium, and tin. Gallinstan is a liquid at room temperature, like mercury, but it's completely non-toxic. It's typically used in medical thermometers as a safer alternative to mercury, plus its low melting point and high conductivity make it useful in heat transfer applications like cooling systems for high performance electronics. To make gallon stand, simply combine 7 parts gallium, 2 parts indium, and 1 part tin by weight. If it's warm enough that gallium is in its liquid state, then you simply need to mix these elements together. After a minute or two of mixing, the elements combine into what's called a eutectic mixture. A somewhat oversimplified explanation of how this all works is that basically the constituent elements of a eutectic mixture interrupt each other's crystal structure, and this results in an alloy with a lower melting point than any of its constituents. In the case of Gallinstan, this temperature is about negative 19 degrees Celsius, which is like um, maybe 2 degrees Fahrenheit. Anyway, I think Gallinstan is pretty fun to play around with. The one downside is that its low surface tension compared to mercury makes it pretty messy. 
However, this unique property means that unlike mercury, you can spread galenstan on any surface you'd like to give it a nice mirror finish. Galenstan can also be used to structurally weaken aluminum, but given it's easier to keep a liquid and sticks to anything it touches means it actually works a whole lot better. So there you have it, the science of gallium, from its ability to cannibalize aluminum to its ability to create alien chemical reactions, I think it's one of the coolest elements on the periodic table. Whether you're a chemist, a tech enthusiast, or just someone who likes a good old-fashioned science experiment, gallium is definitely worth exploring. As always, thanks for watching, and if you enjoyed this, don't forget to like, subscribe, and let me know in the comments what other elements or reactions you'd like to see me dive into. Since my Patreon is still dead, I'd like to thank my members here on YouTube for your support and let you guys know that for now, my most likely plan is to start treating YouTube memberships the way I treated Patreon. This isn't anything too fancy, but it basically just means I'll be available for direct messaging and post sneak peeks of things I'm working on with early access to new uploads. If that sounds interesting to you, consider signing up. It does mean a whole lot and really does help fund the projects I do here. As always, thanks again for watching, and I'll see you next time.